By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing against a Norwegian player. His name is Jun Erik. And um, his deck is quite interesting. I'm not really sure where to, you know, place it. I guess I could call it a Twiddle Trick deck because it's got a full playset of Twiddles um, and it's got all the colors in it except for the color white. So all the other colors are kind of present in this brew. Now you're probably curious thinking, what kind of deck is this? Well, I'm going to show you the deck picture in a moment when we, when we start the deck deck part of the video. Now I'm playing against uh, Yun Erik with my Orbi Tron deck. So that is my red and white Tron brew. Now, before we are going to the deck text, because I've got uh, pictures of both of these decks, I would first just like to mention that you can also click on the timestamp that you can find in the description below. And if you click on it, that will take you straight to the game. So if you want to see the games first and then the deck deck, or if you want to skip the deck deck as a whole, that is absolutely possible. Just check the description below and there you will find the timestamp. Um, as for now, we are going to start with the deck of Yun Erik. So let's look at all those twiddles. And here we see the deck of my opponent, Yun Erik, and there's kind of one really obvious combo that I see here, which is the transmute artifact, um, you know, kind of using it for any other artifact, but the time fold and picking up the time fold and then using your twiddles to, you know, getting extra turns. So that's definitely a combination that I see here. But besides that, it's quite an interesting deck. Um, it's definitely an original brew and I'm really kind of intrigued to see how is this gonna work. For example, I see three Howling Mines, but I don't see a Relic Barrier, which is kind of a combination you see more often, you know, tapping down the Howling Mine and that way you get the cards, but your opponent doesn't. So I guess my opponent wants me, you wants me to draw a lot of cards which is kind of cool, but then I don't see um, an Underworld Dreams or I don't see uh, a Black Vice, for example, that kind of makes makes it make sense, if you can follow what I'm saying. I'm also seeing Animate Artifacts, which I think is extremely cool. You can play an Animate Artifact on the Time Vault, of course, to use it uh, more, but yeah, besides that, I don't really see a target for the Animate Artifact. I do think it's it's fantastic that you're playing with it. It's a card you don't see often, so I'm, I'm always happy to see cards that don't see a lot of play, but it, this kind of, this deck intrigues me. And then also there are like hardly any creatures in here, but then we have three Evil Eyes of Orms by Gore, uh, which is a really cool creature. It's a three six from Legends, and um, it, it actually cannot be blocked. And it's the, um, and only the evil eye can attack. I think that's the thing. So only if, if you play an evil eye, only the evil eye can attack and, and the other evil eyes can attack. Um, and it's also unblockable, uh, but all your other creatures cannot attack. Now that's not really a big problem here in Yoon's deck, considering the only card that kind of maybe wants to attack here is the Soul Kanar. Uh, which is cool, you know, it's cool that he's put one soul canar in it just because he loves the creature so much. So that's nice to see. And of course, it, it is a strong creature. It's a 5-5 five, five for 5 mana with an upside. So it, it, it's a pretty good creature in old school. And uh, we see two Xenic Poltergeists, which I think is really hilarious. I think it's a fantastic creature. It's a 1-1 one, one from Antiquities, 2 black and 1 to cast. Uh, and you can tap it and then it turns target artifact into a creature. Now, it's also called a Mox Killer because a Mox, of course, has a casting cost of zero. So you tap the Xenic Poltergeist and Mox Emerald or whatever Mox uh, would be turned into a creature and the creature would have power and toughness equal to the casting cost. Now, if the casting cost is zero, the artifact, then the creature dies. So in that way, Xenic Poltergeist is a Mox Killer. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting to kind of see it in this deck. And we also see Instal Energies. I'm not really sure what he wants to do with the Instal Energy. So I kind of feel when I'm looking at this deck list that I am I am missing a lot. I think Instal Energy is maybe if I, I mean, I can understand if you put the Animate Artifact on the Time Vault and then you put an Instal Energy on there, um, you know, you have an infinite amount of turns. I see that combo. But the interesting thing is if Time Vault is really your big uh, payoff, you would kind of expect him to play with a full playset of Time Vaults. But maybe Maybe in the spirit of Timmy Talks and of Timmy Channel, he's playing with what he actually has and he's saying, I only have one time vault, but I think it's so cool, so I want to build a deck around it. Um, it is interesting. He does have a lot of cards, though, to find this time vault. So, I mean, I've called this kind of a twiddle trick deck, but actually, I guess the time vault is the trick then. 
interesting let me know in the comments uh below what you think of this deck and and what i may be missing here because i just have this feeling in the back of my head that i'm missing something when i'm looking at this deck picture so please let me know in the comments and uh and also you and let me know if you're watching this video let me know what are some of the other tricks that you have uh in your deck and maybe maybe we're gonna going to see that now in the battle that's that's that, that we're going to watch and everything will be clear but for now when I look at this deck, I'm thinking it's a deck that revolves around Time Vault, but I only see one Time Vault in the actual deck. So that kind of surprises me. Um, so yeah, l let me know what you think about this brew and um, and if I'm missing something here. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to my deck and I'm playing with Orbitron. And here we see the deck that I'm playing with today. This is um, actually one of my oldest decks the Orbitron deck uh, when I started playing old school again, or just actually when I started like playing competitive Magic Kingdom tournaments and stuff. Although I'm not really sure if you can call old school competitive. I hope not, because <laughs> it's it's just a lot of fun, you know, those, those tournaments. But okay, that's, that's a different story. But anyway, you get my, you know, I went from kitchen table to playing some tournaments, and then this was one of the first decks that I started building because I wanted to build something with Tron. Now, it didn't take me long to realize that Tron and old school is really difficult because of the mana base. So when you play Tron, it means that 12 slots of your mana base are taken by colorless mana, and that's really difficult. Another really difficult thing is there are not a lot of cards that help you to get to complete the Tron very quickly. So instead, I've chosen for a different approach. I've said, you know what, I wanna build a deck that works when I have Tron, but I also wanna build a deck that works when I haven't got Tron. And so therefore I really quickly landed on, on the color white because white is really the best control color uh, in old school because you've got Swords to Plowsiers, you've got Disenchant. I'm sure you're thinking, oh, shouldn't you say blue is the best control color in old school? Uh, blue is the best color in old school, I'll give you that. But don't forget this, the, the white control package is just extremely strong. You've got Swords to Plowsiers, four of them, which removes a creature from the game. Don't underestimate that. It doesn't go to the graveyard. It is gone. It is gone. So that is really important for disenchants. Having the option to choose artifact or enchantment makes it an incredibly strong card. And of course, there's the balance. And balance is a card that can get you back from behind, which is important. And of course, balance doesn't count artifacts. And look at my deck. It's chock full of artifacts. It does count artifact creatures because they're creatures but it doesn't count Relic Barrier, Howling Mine, the Mox, and everything else, the ICs. So for me, Balance is great. I can play out my cheap artifacts, then play out Balance, wiping the board from all the creatures, wiping my opponent's hand, basically being a Wrath of God and a Mind Twist in one. I mean, Balance is, <laughs> it is really a, it's, it's a killer card, I tell you, in case, in case you don't know that yet. You probably do, do but in case you don't, know that and uh, as you can see the deck actually the the base of the deck is very cheap to play it has a lot of cheap cards in it and i did that on purpose because i don't want to lean too much on my tron so um what i've done is i've played i've chosen to play with the relic barrier uh howling mine uh, winter orb combination also known as the parfait package which basically means if i tap my howling mine it doesn't work if i tap my winter orb it doesn't work so that means that when I'm plant casting a Winter Orb, I can choose to tap it down with my Relic Barrier or Icy Manipulator in the end step of my opponent. Therefore, Winter Orb will not work against me, but it will only work against my opponent. I can do something similar with the Howling Mine. With the Howling Mine, it works the other way around. I need to tap the Howling Mine after my draw step. So I draw two extra cards. Then in my upkeep, uh, or sorry, in my main phase, I tap it down or at the at the end of my turn at, as long as I do it in my turn then I pass the turn to my opponent and because the howling mine is tapped it doesn't work so my opponent only draws one card so that is all very cheap to get on the table so even if I have mana issues I can get those basics on the table furthermore um, swords to plow here's disenchant very cheap spells to cast so I don't need a lot of land for them obviously when playing with Tron you also want to build in a payoff you want to do something when you when you hit it big when you've got a lot of lands now uh, Tron in case you don't know it works in a way that you need to get all the three cards uh, Tron lands on the board so you need uh, Urza's Tower, Urza's Mine and Urza's Power Plant on the table when you have those on the table what happens is that instead of tapping for one mana these lands tap for multiple mana the tower taps for three and the mine and the power plant tap for two each so that means you get a lot 
of mana. What are you going to do with that mana? Obvious, you're going to put it in an X spell. And you can see I'm playing with Fireball and Disintegrate. So those two cards are clearly my finisher. I just want to kill my opponent with that. Before I get into that stage of the game though, maybe I first want to cast a Triskelion. Triskelion is six to cast, but if you have Tron, it means I only have to tap two Urza's Towers to cast a Triskelion. I'm also playing with one Argivian Archaeologist. I mean, I love this card. Argivian Archaeologist is two white and one to cast. And then you can tap it and you can pay two white and one again. And then you can return any artifact from your graveyard to your hand. So that means that I can kind of get a Triskelion cycle going. Obviously, this is costing a lot of mana, but the whole idea with Tron is that I generate a lot of mana. Now, one of the weaknesses of this deck is that I don't have any flyers. And one of the flyers that I am really, well, afraid of, I just find it really annoying uh, is the Surrender Afrit, and therefore I am playing with City in a Bottles. So I'm playing with two City in a Bottles, and they can kill the Surrender Afrit, but they can also kill an Urnum. You know, you've got those really quick Urnum getting decks. I can take care of them with one City in a Bottle, and also, of course, with Jews and Jins. So City in a Bottle is just a great way to kind of uh, manage those early Arabian Night threats. It's also a great way to get City of Brasses off the table, because in old school, a lot of decks are playing with three colors, four colors, sometimes even five colors, and they tend to have quite of a weak, they tend to have quite a weak mana base. So with City in a Bottle, I can take care of those City of Brasses. Now, as you can see on my sideboard, I've got two extra Maze of Ifs, because I'm only playing one Maze of If main. And you may think, isn't that a bit, isn't that overdoing it? You already have four, um, four Swords to Plowsiers and one Maze of If. Well, when you're playing mono black aggro, especially playing against Hypnotic Spectres, it is extremely important for me to being able to, to deal with that. I mean, I don't want to start discarding cards. So whenever I'm playing against an aggressive deck like that, I'm definitely going to board in both of my mazes of if to kind of protect me from that. So that's just a way for me to cope with the Dark Ritual uh, hippie play. And of course, ideally, you want to just draw swords and say, hey man, you just wasted two cards and I'm just gonna use one Swords to Plowsiers to take care of your Hypnotic Spectre. But, you know, Swords is only four cards in my entire deck. So I want more security than that. So that's why one of the reasons why I've put two mazes in my sideboard. But um, just looking at, at the whole deck as a whole, the idea is kind of to have this easy low mana curve start and then once I have Tron to have like a big payoff, paying my, playing my Triskelions, drawing a lot of cards with Howling Mine, having a lot of mana available to play all of the things out that I draw, uh, ideally even using my Archaeologist to get like Chaos Orb back from the graveyard and keep flipping. I mean, how cool is that? And I've, I've got my X spells to kill my opponent. So, you know what? Let's go to the game and let's see, um, let's see if this plan is actually going to work out. Let's go. Game number one. So I'm sitting on the left here and Yoon Idik with his pretty cool, pretty cool Solkanar, the Swamp King playmat here sitting on the right. And uh, yeah, looks like I'm starting with 40 life. <laughs> I think I'm gonna try to keep track of the life total of Yoon Idik as well. That's probably what I wanna do here. Nice, nice sleeves, by the way. Yoon Idik, pretty cool. And uh, it looks like I'm taking a mulligan here, going down to six cards. Not really sure who's starting. It looks like Yoon has also taken a mulligan. Yeah, he's also taken a mulligan. Okay, so I'm looking at my cards and I think we're good to go here. And Yoon is starting with a Volcanic Island. Wow, and a Mox Jet. That's a pretty good start here. I'm starting with just a, mo uh, sorry, not a Mox Power Plant, just an Urza's Power Plant. Passing to a Tropical Island by Yoon. And I'm playing a Plateau. And am I going to play, for example, a Relic? Yeah, there's a Relic Barrier. I already thought so. That means I'm probably going to tap down his Mox Jet in his upkeep. And then he's going to his draw step here. And uh, let's see what he's going to do now in his main phase. Looking at his cards, a little bit in the tank here. Maybe he has an answer for the Relic Barrier, but he's not sure sure if he wants to use it. And 
there is a swamp into a soul ring. So that means four land. I'm tapped out. He can do whatever he wants, but he's just passing turn here. And playing an Urza's Tower. So that's looking pretty good. I now need the Urza's Mine to get Tron going. And then it can start doing crazy stuff here. Uh, hopefully I can find, for example, a Howling Mine. It looks like I can. I'm just passing turn here. Tapping down the Soul Ring. But he still has four, four lands. Or four mana, I should say. So I don't think it's going to be a big problem here for Yun Eric. But still, it's the best option for me. To just tap that down. And there is a City of Brass. We talked a little bit about mana bases and City of Brasses in the uh, in the deck tech. A lot of decks really rely heavily on City of Brass. So if you've got a way to take that out, I mean, it can do wonders. And um, let's see what Yun is going to do here. Tapping five lands yes taking a damage i guess from the city of brass going to 19 and he's casting oh look at that evil eye by orms gore wow this is the three six that i talked about it's from legends and it cannot be tapped by um or sorry it cannot be blocked by any creatures and look at that playing a winter orb that means that june can only untap one of his lands and I'm also using the Relic Barrier here, which is really nice. You can see the Relic Barrier here working to kind of keep the land count of Yun in check to tap down the Soul Ring. He's playing a basic mounted, so all of a sudden he only has three lands left. And that, of course, is the problem with Old School. Like you can say, okay, Winter Orb is a really good locking card. But, you know, remember that your opponent will always have artifact mana rocks. You know, you, you, you got to think of Moxen and, and, and Soul Rings. And of course, uh, ooh, this is pretty cool. A Wheel of Fortune. Wow, that is nice. Look at that. I have to actually discard a Wheel of Fortune of my own. And also a Fireball. And what I wanted to say about the mana base is, of course, you always have to think about the Black Lotus as well in old school. You'll be surprised how many players actually own a Black Lotus. I mean, it's insane. And drawing a card here. And look at that. I've got Tron assembled. So that means that my tower now taps for three and my mine and power plant each for two. So I've got seven mana now open. Tapping six here. Does that mean a Triskelion? Oh, it's actually a Suchi. I think I'm over. T oh, I'm also playing a Howling Mine. I wanted to say I think I'm tapping too much here. But no, six is the total casting cost for Suchi um, and for the Howling Mine. Passing turn here, it looks like I'm once again tapping down the Soul Ring, choosing not to tap down my Howling Mine, but choosing to kind of keep his lands, his mana base in check here. And he's gonna probably attack with the Evil Eye, or is he gonna use it as a blocker? Remember, it's got six toughness, so it can pretty much block everything. Doesn't have flying though, but against my deck, that's fine since I have no flyers in my deck. Oh, look at that! There's the Chaos Orb. He's going to take a damage. He's actually going to flip on my Winter Orb. And uh, strangely enough, I'm quite happy that he does that in my turn because that means that I get to untap everything. So I think this was a little miscalculation uh, by Yun. And of course, I now get to draw two new cards. So if I can just find a new Winter Orb and I'm playing with three of them, so the chance, chance is there. I just have to find the remaining two in my deck. If I can play that out now, look at that, a Workshop. Uh, then it's even worse for, for Yoon, and he's still stuck with his mana base. So tapping here now the workshop. Actually deciding to tap my tower and my dual land instead. Oh, yeah, and here is the bad news for Yoon Erik. And I'm also using a disenchant to take care of the soaring, tapping down the Mox Jet, so I'm really focusing on just keeping his mana as low as possible. The only problem I have now is that I need to deal damage to him, but besides from that, I've got this game pretty much under control here. And here you can see that effect of, of Yun Edic's decision, um, you know, to use that Chaos Orb in his turn instead of waiting um, uh, for for my own turn then again maybe his reasoning was if I use it now 
he cannot use a disenchant. So that kind of makes sense as well. So I can understand that. Attacking you with the Suchi, um, and there's another Winter Orb and a Soul Ring. Suchi's doing no damage uh, because of that Maze of If. And the strange situation here is that despite the fact that I've got this pretty much under control, um, Yun Idik still has an unblockable creature. And look at that, he's slowly building up his mana base again. He's now got three lands there. Beautiful revised duels. And um, yeah, I mean, he's still very much in the game. I'm on 14 here and uh, Yun Erik is on 17. And I think all that damage is self-inflicted actually. Let's see what he's gonna do now. He's discarding actually. So passing turn, you're discarding a Howling Mine. And we're kind of dis discussing the life total here of, of Uniatic. And it looks like, okay, I wanted to start my turn, but it looks like Yun still needs to discard, I think. Or does he want to do something in my untapped step? Can he do that? No, then he must, yeah, he's still discarding. And there is a Jandor's Saddleback. Beautiful card, really great to see that uh, in a deck. You don't see that card very often. And there is a Mox Ruby from my side, which is nice, but I need to draw into something to, you know, at least deal um, with that evil eye. And look at that, I'm choosing to Tap my Howling Mine. Oh, double twiddle. That is pretty cool. He's playing a double twiddle on both of my uh, Winter Orbs. So that means he can untap everything. He's got a full grip of cards here. Drawing card number, well, he's just played two twiddles. So I guess, um, you know, he's got five cards in hand. Drawing card number six. This is pretty cool. There's actually an opening here and I'm, I'm on 14, dropping to 11. I wonder what he can do here. I mean, I'm sure he's not just gonna pass turn, right? He's got everything untapped. He can do whatever he wants. And tapping two, tapping four, no, th okay. Tapping a lot. Will we see like a brain guys or something? Oh, another evil eye. Ooh, and I'm on 11. That means next turn he can swing for six. Then I'll drop to five. Wow, I need to draw something against these two creatures. So drawing two more cards. Remember, they are unblockable. I cannot block them with my Suchi, even if I want to. I simply can't. And it looks like I'm tapping. Okay, finding an Icy Manipulator. That's actually pretty good. And I'm finding a City in a Bottle. And that means he's going to lose his City of Brass, but I'm also going to lose my City of Brass. I hope I'm not forgetting that because it seems kind of odd that I didn't tap my City of Brass then. So this actually happens more often than you think where I'm forgetting to take my own Arabian Night cards out of the game. I really need to discard my own City of Brass here. So hopefully I'm still going to do that. It looks like I'm already at the end step though because I'm tapping down my Howling Mind passing turn here. So let's hope this doesn't influence the game too much. And I mean, I have enough land regardless, but you never know. And remember, City of Brass can make any color of mana. And before his attack, I'm going to tap down one of the eyes. He's going to attack with the other. So I'm going to drop to eight here. And there is a Felwer Stone. And this is funny because I think I'm now explaining to Yun that because of the City of Brass, his Felwer Stone makes every color of mana, but I seem to keep forgetting I've got a City in a Bottle on the playing field, so that card shouldn't even be, be there, but okay. Doesn't seem to play a big role at the moment. Drawing two more cards. What I have to do now, of course, is um, 
is, is, is get something for that second evil. I mean, I'm on eight, so I'm on a three turn clock. Let's see what I'm gonna do. Tapping down the Howling Mine again. Attacking with the Suchi, of course, because of the Winter Orb. So I kind of wanna force him to um, use his Maze of If. Counting my lands, so he's untapping it. And it looks like I'm passing turn here. There's a twiddle. Oh, he's probably gonna twiddle my um, my icy manipulator. Oh, oh no, this is bad news. Oh, this is a bad news for me. So that would really, really be special here. He can then attack me for six, then I'm gonna drop to two. And if he's got like, I don't know, he's playing with red. If he's got something like a bolt, I am toast. Wow. This is interesting to see because it kind of feels like I've got everything under control. I'm drawing more cards than he. Um, I'm kind of controlling the amount of lands that he can use. But despite that, the, the eyes are simply killing me here. He can attack now with both, gonna drop me to two. Wow, if he's got a bolt or any, any other way to just, only two more damage I'm done for. And it's going to be interesting now to see next turn, at least I can swing with the Suchi, so it's gonna drop to 13. And let's see how much land do I have, because if I have like a Fireball or Disintegrate in hand, I've got three, I've got the Tower, I've got nine lands, Soaring, 11 lands, 12, 13, yeah, if I think, oh, he's playing, He's playing an Icy Manipulator so he can tap down my Suchi. And I'm playing an Urtz's Mine. Counting my lands here and I'm still, I keep counting my own City of Brass. Let's see how much land do I have. I've got six. Oh, that's a Disintegrate. But this is not correct. I mean, you, I haven't won the game I think. Cause Let's 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 take another look here at the mana base, and uh, and let's let's talk about it. Let's uh, put it here. Let's go back to that play and let's have another look. So here we see that crucial disintegrate. I'm about to play. Let's look at the mana base. That's the most important. So I see two towers. That's six lands. I see, and I'm I'm tapping here. I see three other Tron lands. That's another six land. That's twelve. Soaring is fourteen. Two plateaus is sixteen. And he is on 17 life, so I do need that City of Brass. I'm using my Mox Ruby to cast a Disintegrate. So actually, Yoon, you should have been on one life, and then it would have been your turn, and you would have won the game. You would have won the game. Obviously, if I can kill Yoon Idik, I would have used my Disintegrate dif different, you know, probably on one of his evil eyes. I would have to do that. Um, but wow, that would have changed the game completely. So... I, I want to show this and also kind of to show how easy it is to make a mistake. And uh, obviously this is not intentional, but a mistake is easily made. I'm playing City in a Bottle in my deck. I'm looking at my opponent's cards. I'm not looking at my uh, at the cards that I have on the battlefield. If I would have known, I would have still played it, by the way, because I don't think the City in a Bottle uh, or the City of Brass at that time uh, made a big impact for me. Uh, but now you can see the difference. It's, it's literally a difference between winning a game or losing a game. So here you, you've lost this game, but you've actually at least, yeah, you've won this game. Um, so it's, it's quite, a, it's still important. And I see this so often um, in, in my recordings of all the matches, you see it so often, mistakes are being made. And, um, you know, 99% out of, out of 100, uh, it's, it's not intentional. It's an honest mistake. This was also an honest mistake, but it does make a big difference. So that's, that's an advice that, uh, that Grandpa Timmy can give you is to uh, look at the basics of the game. There, people make more mistakes. I make way more mistakes than I thought I did before I started recording my matches. So uh, anyway, this is game number one. So I guess I've won this one, but it doesn't really feel good. Let's go to game number two and, uh, and see what happens there. 
Game number two, and it's uh, my opponent, Yoon, on the play here in that second game. And starting off with a Volcanic Island passing turn. And there's a City of Brass. And there is a Felberstone. So the Felberstone, of course, making any colored mana now because of the City of Brass. And I'm casting a Relic Barrier here. That probably means that I'm going to tap down the Fower Stone. And Relic Barrier, really, it's, it's, it's such a good card. Not just for a Parfait combination, but it's just... I mean, it works against Mishra's Factories. It works against all types of Mana Rocks, all artifacts. It's really just a great card. And only two to cast. And activating it is, is free. And there is a Howling Mine tapping it with my Relic Barrier. So that means that my opponent will only draw one card. And I'm not using my Strip Mine here. So apparently I'm trying to hold my Strip Mine back for another card. Another land to destroy, I should say. But that does mean that you now has five lands five mana available. Of course, the Felber Stone not being a land, but it does produce any color of mana now because of my City of Brass. Tapping five here, and there we see the Evil Eye. And um, interesting, I think I should have used my Strip Mine because that would have meant that Yoon wouldn't have been able to cast that Evil Eye. And tapping three here, casting a Winter Orb. So that means that we will see a similar scenario as in game one will, where Yoon will not be able to do too much, but he does have that evil eye on the board, so he'll be able to deal damage to me. And we actually saw in game one that he was quite successful doing that. So I really need to find, um, I need to find the swords to plow series, or perhaps I have put, and look at that, now I am activating uh, my strip mine. I mean, that's just too little too late, to be honest. Taking 3 damage here, dropping to 15, but that's all that uh, Yoon's doing. And tapping 4 here, bringing an Icy Manipulator in the game. So that's going to help me from the Evil Eye. And look at that, I even have a Maze of If. So that probably means that I'm going to use the Maze of If. And look at this, I'm choosing to use my Relic Barrier on the Felwer Stone, then use my... Icy Manipulator to tap the land that he wants to untap because of um, Winter Orb, he can only untap one land, of course. So that means he has no land to his disposal. And I'm saying, you know what? You can draw two cards, it doesn't matter because you have no lands to do anything with it anyway. So kind of going for a different strategy here. And uh, obviously the Winter Orb is also bothering me. Keeping one land here, playing an Urza's Tower. Now I need an Urza's Mine to activate Tron. And I'm actually doing the same trick. So that means that I'm, I'm taking three damage now from, evil, uh, from the Evil Eye. It means I'm dropping to 11. So I am really counting on maybe drawing into... Look at that, untapping my Mesa, drawing into an Urza's Mine. Of course, I do draw two cards. The swords would also be nice just to get rid of that creature. Untapping the mace, so that means I don't have to take damage next turn. Let's see what I can do. Looks like I'm not finding any land. Oh, I am playing a City of Brass. And I'm doing the same, tapping the Felwar and tapping whatever untaps on the side of Yoon. And I'm not sure if that Felwer Stone is now tapped or not. And I think he's drawing an extra card because he forgot to draw an extra card last turn. So I said, you know what, just draw the extra card. It's fine. We're, we're pretty relaxed playing these games. So that's why you see Yoon here drawing three cards instead of two. And look at that. He actually has to discard... going through his hand here and also discarding a Howling Mine, passing turn here. And let's see, what land am I going to untap here? I'm gonna untap the 
maze of if I want to be sure that I can stop the evil eye and look at that now Tron is actually activated with that Urza's mine and I'm actually discarding a wheel of fortune here interesting and I'm really kind of playing the patient game here finally finding a sword to plow here so taking care of that evil eye does mean I take a damage from my own city of brass this is a very interesting game so far um, it looks like I wonder what I'm gonna do I wanted to say it looks like I can start using my uh, my relic barrier maybe on my uh, winter orb but I'm actually not doing that I'm playing very disciplined here and there we see Yun coming here with two mana sources, the Mox Emerald and the City of Brass. And the question is, will he be able to do something? Perhaps passing turn and play a disenchant in my turn or doing it straight away. I think for Yun, the, the, um, the Winter Orb is definitely the card he wants to get rid of. And he's passing turn here. And despite the fact I only have three lands untapped, because I've got Tron active, I actually have seven mana. Now I'm tapping five lands for a Suchi. And remember, because it's Swedish, there is no mana burn. So normally I would get a point of mana burn now, but because it's Swedish, there is no mana burn. And there's a Suchi here. And now I'm thinking, what am I going to do here? Because I can no longer tap down all of his mana. Look at that playing a Twiddle. That is going to be really nice for Yuna, and I'm actually tapping down my my Howling Mind in response of the Twiddle because I don't want him to draw any extra cards now that he has all his land available. Of course, I have that Icy Manipulator, so I could possibly tap his Maze at the end of his turn and then deal four damage with my Suchi. It's going to be interesting here to see what's going to happen. Looks like he's actually on 21, of course, because of that um, Swords to Plowsiers on the Evil Eye earlier in the game. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a mess from time to time, this game. I, I'm willing to admit that. We're forgetting to draw an extra card, and then, of course, we had that whole disaster in game one. But still, you know, fun games. Uh, Yoon is a really, Yoon Edic is a really nice guy to play against. And his deck is quite interesting. And he's really into tank here. He's got, of course, a full grip of cards. He can really just do whatever. Looks like he's counting, which is never really a good sign. Really looking at his options here. And as you can see, my deck is kind of working the way I would like it to work. Using that Winter Orb and Icy to kind of lock my opponent and then, you know, get the card advantage with the Howling Mines, get Tron working so that I have enough lands and I don't need to untap a lot of lands and just dropping some threats, doing some work, controlling the board. That's kind of the idea of this deck, so I can't complain. But I have to say, those evil eyes, they're actually pretty good. Although, you know, a Maze of Ip does wonders against a card like that. There he goes, tapping a Felwer Stone. So what is he going to do here? Will that be... Oh, interesting. Transmute Artifact. That probably means he's going to look up... Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. So here we go. Wow, there's his Time Vault. And remember, Time Vault comes into play tap, but um, you can pay a turn to untap it, and then you can take an extra turn. Bad connection, unfortunately. Look at that, also playing a Demonic Tutor. Oh, wow. So, Yun Edic is really taking full advantage of this one turn that he's actually got. You know, remember, he used his Twiddle to tap down my winter orb and that's why he can untap with everything and so far 
he's played a transmute artifact to find his time vault now he's playing a um, demonic tutor is probably going to look up a twiddle or something to untap uh, to untap his time vault and will he be able to go into the loop and like get endless turns that's of course the big question here and then he has won the game I mean these decks they can win out of nowhere and with with a, a demonic tutor and a transmute artifact in hand I mean he had a very strong hand and then I also understand why he was in the tank so long and he's actually still kind of in the tank thinking what should I go for now and the question here is for me am I going to get another turn that is the big question so he's going through his deck again he's looking for something to endlessly loop his time vault and that would mean the end of game number two here and a win here for Unitic that would bring us to a tie into a uh, decisive third game and I guess that one card there must be his removed evil eye I guess yeah because he's not shuffling it in and tapping some more taking some damage here from his own city of brass and there there is the twiddle i expected it so he's going to tap it again for an extra turn and he's going to tap again playing a howling mine of his own so that means he's going to draw some extra cards so he's going to untap and of course his time vault is not going to untap and I'm actually going to tap down his Howling Mine here so that he doesn't get that extra card that he's hoping for. So hopefully he cannot find another Twiddle or another way to untap the Time Vault. I mean, this, this turn is going to be crucial, really. If he cannot get an extra turn, I feel like I kind of got this in the back. There we see a Jander settle back. Ooh, look at that! Wow, a time twister. That means we're shuffling our, our um, graveyard back into our library and we're going to draw seven fresh cards. The thing is, I'm completely tapped out. All he needs really here is another twiddle. And uh, and then if he, can, uh, if he can play an animate artifact then. So first he needs a twiddle. Look at that, finding a twiddle, slamming it down on the time vault, taking an extra turn. That means he's going to untap with everything. Except for, of course, the Time Vault. And now he needs to find an Animate Artifact. And then he can untap his Time Vault with the Jandor Saddleback. Tapping four here. Oh, how cool is this? And he can untap, take an extra turn. And uh, basically he can go on forever because, because it's a creature now. It's going to untap. So, and he's kind of explaining, now I've got the cycle, I've got endless amounts of turns, and I'm saying, you know what, man, you've won this one, and look at that, slamming the fireball on the table here, I was so close to actually winning this game, I only needed one more turn, but when you're playing against these time fold decks and they're in their loop, I mean, it's the end, it's no sense in continuing uh, the game, so... Wow, Yoon, well done, and I think you definitely deserve this victory after that first game where, you know, I still have to apologize for that, that mistake on my part, keeping that City of Brass in the game. So, Yoon is winning this second game. That means we are going on to a game number three. Game number three is about to start here, and who's going to take this match? I have to say, it was really nice, Yoon Edic, to see your deck going off in, uh, in game number two, and I completely understand why you were in the tank for so long. Because, it, I mean, that was a difficult turn. That was, I mean, you were staring down your hand and you've already decided to play your twiddle on my orb and you had an animate artifact and you had a demonic tutor in hand and you knew I have this one opening and it, right, it has to happen. And you know what? You pulled it off. So, well done. It's 1-1. One, one. We're going here for game three. Uh, I get to start here in this final game and let's see if I can get you off of that combo. And starting here with an Urza's Tower passing turn. And there is a Volcanic Island and a pass as well. And playing an Urza's Mine. And look at that Ancestral Recall here from Yun Eric Finding three fresh cards. Let's see what he's going to do with them. Another Volcanic. And there is a Soul Ring. It's looking pretty good. 
Does he have a follow-up here for the Soaring or will he have to discard a card here? Looking at his hand, tapping three. Okay, interesting here, playing a recall on his Ancestral Recall. And now he's got to bin something, but that looks like a pretty good deal here. And chucking an Animate Artifact there and getting his Ancestral Recall back. Finding a Plateau, so not finding an Urza's Power Plant. Playing a Chaos Orb here, passing turn. There is an Island by Yoon having five lands, but no black mana sources to play his Evil Eyes. And we haven't seen Solkanar, by the way, so it would be nice to see Solkanar in this game number three. Tapping for a Felwar. And there is an Icy Manipulator. And I'm actually not flipping on the Icy. That kind of surprises me because usually an Icy is like an auto flip for me. Maybe I have a Disenchant in hand. Finding another Urza's Tower, so no Tron for me, unfortunately. And it looks like I'm deciding to flip here. And that means we are going to slow-mo. So let's take a look. Take him, <laughs> making sure I've got enough space. And uh, let's see, targeting the Icy, of course. Taking my time. And usually what I do, yeah, I do this and then I go back exactly to target. Then I go back up and now I flip. Boom, and that is a hit, a nice clean flip. And that means the Icy is gone. I mean, Icy Manipulator is just such a difficult card. I love playing with it, but I don't like playing against it. And uh, let's see, what else can I do here? Still a little bit surprised I didn't do it on end step. Maybe I wanted to wait to see if I could uh, fish for a disenchant. And I'm actually expecting Yoon here to play as, yeah, as Ancestral Recall on end step. So finding three more cards. And it looks like I'm kind of contemplating, do I want to respond to that? I don't think so, though. And there's Yoon Eric uh, starting with his main face here. Playing a City of Brass. Oh, this is a card from the sideboard playing a Gloom. So that means all my white spells now got very, very expensive. I believe I have to pay three extra for my Swords to Plowsiers and my Disenchants. Oh, look at this. Playing a Time Volt and a Twiddle, taking an extra turn. Uh-oh. And will Yoon be able to find his combo again and go infinite and actually win game number three here with his Time Volt deck? There is an Evil Eye. Not great, but not the end of the world for me at this point in the game. Oh, look at that instant energy. That is pretty cool. That means it gains haste and he can attack instantly. Dropping here to 17. Well, actually, it's not haste. It's different than haste, but, you know, it can attack. Uh, of course, the dream is to put Insult Energy on the... Oh, Disenchant paying three extra, taking care of the Time Vault. What I wanted to say is the dream is to cast Animate Artifact on the Time Vault and then cast um, an Insult Energy on it. And then you have infinite turns as well. But, you know, fact of the matter is he's still dealing damage now with his evil eye. I'm dropping here to 14. And let's see what I can do. Playing a Triskelion here. Tapping 6 because they still don't have Tron active. But Mishra's Workshop is really, really helping here. So that means I've got a 4-4 four, four Triskelion. Another attack. Remember, it's unblockable. I cannot block the evil eye. Dropping to 11. And is he going to block? He's actually going to block because he doesn't want me to kill him uh, with his strike after combat. So because I can first deal 4 damage to the evil eye. And then I can take um, some counters off and kill it. But look at that. There is actually a uh, Swords to Plowsiers here. That does mean that Yun Eric is gaining 3 life. But at least I'm getting rid of the evil eye. And it's really that white control that's kind of uh, bringing me back in the game. The Disenchant and Swords of Plowsiers were very important here. Now I'm on 11, but it looks like it's kind of stabilized. He's passing turn here, and look at that. I've got tons and tons of mana. 
if I can find some more trikes, maybe even assemble Tron. Let's see, what can I do? Another trike here on the board. Remember, I'm playing with a full playset. And it's a really good feeling to have two trikes here on the battlefield. Let's see what Yoon can do here. Ooh, finding transmute artifact. What is he going to look for? Remember, he only plays with one time vault. So I'm curious, what is he going to, to fish up? What's he, what is he going to fetch out of his deck that can actually help him here? I mean, he, 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 can, he can find another Icy, but is, is that really going to help that much? I mean, he can take down one creature, but it's not ideal. Let's see. Does he have a Chaos Orb? That could at least take care of one of the trikes. Yeah, there we see the Chaos Orb. So that means we're probably going to see a flip here by Yoon. The interesting thing about this is, and, and, and this is a funny thing that not many people know about Chaos Orb, and, and somebody actually uh, mentioned it to me, is that when you activate Chaos Orb, you don't have to say what your target is. So in this case, he's going to activate. And then, well, let's first look at his flip. Let's see if this flip is a success. And then I'll, I'll finish my story. Um, or actually, I, I think I'm telling you and Eric now about this. When you activate Chaos Orb, you don't have to choose, you don't have to tell me what your target is. So that means that right now I have to choose if I want to respond. He's going to say I'm going to activate my Chaos Orb. And then if I want to respond by, for example, taking my counters off of Triskelion to deal damage to Yoon Eric, um, you know, I have to do it of both my Triskelions or not, because I don't know which one he's targeting. So let's have a look at the flip. And, ooh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a miss here by Yoon Eric. So that's, uh, that's lucky for me here. But it's, it's quite interesting. So that's why you don't see me taking out any counters because I don't know which Triskelion he's actually going for. And attacking right now, dealing eight damage here to, to Yoon. That means he's going to eight. And can I actually finish it already? Of course, I've got also six direct damage on the board because of those trike counters. There is a Wheel of Fortune. Is he going to play it? I wonder why not actually he is going to play it which is pretty cool I am responding to it though do I have a disenchant still okay I'm disenchanting I guess I'm going for the uh yeah I'm going for the gloom here and disenchanting my wrath of god that came in from the sideboard and let's see now there's a little uh connection loss here there are seven cards Drawn by Yoon. And look at that, I'm almost stepped out here. And this is again one of those moments in the game that we also saw in game number two where basically Yoon Eric has one opening, a full grip of cards, and the question is, can he can he can he win it? Can he do something magical here, just like he did in game number two, to still get the victory? I mean, it's going to be really tough. He's basically on two life because of those six trike counters on my side of the board. That means that City of Brass is also a difficult card for him to use. Look at that. Taking back his Ancestral Recall with the Regrowth, going to seven. So he's basically on one life, drawing three new cards. There's not really anything he can do, right? Is there? I mean, what can he do? And playing, is that an underground C? And there's another, oh, the connection is getting really bad right now. Okay, he's going to six here, and uh, it looks like he's kind of blowing up himself here. And uh, <laughs> I mean, there, was, there wasn't much to do. For a moment there, I thought, is he going to pull it off again? And um, it was really nice uh, to play these games against you, uh, you and And in all honesty, I, I think... If I wouldn't have made that mistake with the City of Brass, you probably would have won game one. So technically you've won this match and I think it kind of shows how important it is to always keep an eye on each other's boards. And no matter how experienced you are, like a small little mistake that can be decisive for the game, it's it's so easy to make. It's so easy to make. So um, 
that is that is definitely a tip I can give to all of you instead of thinking oh I need to to get that piece of power or I need to get that more expensive card or I need to uh, you know brew a new deck you know just by following the rules in a game and by making sure your opponent is doing the same that can actually win you matches okay so amen to that that was Papa Timmy talking to you um, anyway thank you very much for watching another episode of Timmy Talks the channel where we talk old school magic and thank you Yoon Erik for playing this game against me um, if you want to support the channel you can do that by watching this video hey you just did that so thank you very much you can also leave a like leave a comment share this video on your socials tell everybody about Timmy Talks about the channel help me help us grow and become even bigger than the 2,000 subscribers that we already have talking about subscribing if you're not a sub yet please subscribe to the channel or consider doing so that really helps YouTube loves that and I get higher in the YouTube algorithm so it would be great if you could do that and you can also sponsor the show so if you want the show to continue if you want the show to grow you can sponsor us financially and you can do that by becoming a patron there's probably a link popping up right now click on that link that will take you to Timmy's patreon page and there you can check out all the different ways of how you can support Timmy talks and how you can support this old school magic channel talking about Patrons, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the wonderful, fantastic, amazing patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als ik het als somba kan zien.